morning. We're going to go ahead and get going. The Felix Battistella Lectureship is in honor of Dr. Felix Battistella, who was one of the former um, division directors of trauma and was a well-loved professor here at UC Davis. And so in honor of that, we actually try and find a very prominent trauma surgeon to come in and um, give a lecture on a yearly basis. And this year's is Dr. Roxy Albrecht. And Dr. Roxy Albrecht and I have been friends for many, many years. And so it's a real honor for me to be able to introduce her. She's currently the Division Director of Trauma at the University of Oklahoma. But she hails from her medical school training at um, Iowa, for those of you Hawkeyes in the audience. And from there, she did her surgery training at Michigan State. And from there to Miami for a critical care fellowship, and then back to Michigan for a few years before moving to the University of um, New Mexico in Albuquerque, where she was an attending, and then on to Oklahoma, where she currently is now. Uh, she just finished a stint on the American Board of Surgery. She's been president of the Midwestern Surgical Society, and most recently, she's been the president of Western Trauma Association. And so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Roxy Albrecht, who's going to be talking on patient safety, our duty. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Um, it's, uh, you know, I think I picked the wrong topic after listening to you all's presentation today because I think patient safety uh, is really at your forefront here. And I was talking last night at dinner with Dr. Farmer and said, you yeah, know, I think we've got pa patient safety down and we're, you know, need to work on some of our patient satisfaction <laughs> numbers and things like that. But safety goes along with that. Uh, once you have those two things at your forefront, quality and safety and patient satisfaction, and everything about the patient, you know, you're there, um, as we talked last night. So uh, no disclosures. Uh, it is a great honor to give this name lecture for Dr. Battistella. Um, I met him uh, early in my career at, when we were s at similar meetings trying to rise up in the academic ranks and uh, truly you could tell by just meeting him at those meetings that you know he was the winner of these awards. Uh, he was uh, an, an outstanding uh, individual and it was um, quite heart um, heartening to see that he passed, but, but you recognized him, and he got the Distinguished Alumni Award even uh, after his death. But, you know, to me, uh, I've all, always been about the, the job and the patient, and, uh, you know, this, he epitomizes that, the talented, uh, hardworking, harmoniously with the team. We talked about last night, uh, I, I started teams early in my life that when I went to Iowa undergrad, I was the captain of the softball team. Uh, for three years uh, during my uh, stint there and was one of the first um, uh, Title IX um, athletes that, uh, for women's scholarships. Uh, so it's great to see what, to what women's athletics have done to throw that plug in there too. But again, back to Dr. Bias Daz, he uh, truly was an athlete also, you know, trying to help others by riding his bicycle in a race across the, the United States to uh, uh, highlight uh, donation. So, uh, and excellence in patient care. And so I'm glad that uh, I was able to be able to give this lecture. Um, he also has that passion that, that, that I think all of us in trauma feel like it's, it's all about getting that patient off the table and, and cheating death and giving them a second chance uh, at life. And that's a, a testament to the patient safety of this uh, institution. So my talk, uh, patient safety, our duty, my duty, and why it really matters. I, I took this from uh, Sully Sullenberger's book. It was his duty to uh, do what he did when he landed that plane on the, the Hudson. You know, he was early in crew resource management. He was an instructor in it. Uh, he practiced, he simulated, he was prepared for that event that happened, and he was successfully uh, able to land, do a water landing on a plane and save you know, hundreds of, or 130 some lives in that situation. 
we have taken that same oath. I don't remember my medical student oath. I, I'm sure somebody does, some does, some people do, and actually one of my partners can cite hers uh, word for word almost, which was impressive. But again, it's respecting uh, our patient's confidentiality, respecting our teachers, upholding integrity, and, and avoiding harm. We also take that when we uh, pledge to the American College of Surgeons that we will um, pledge to pursue the practice of surgery with honesty and in a place, uh, place the welfare and the rights of our patient above all else. We promise that each patient uh, that we deal with, would, we would like that the same as ourselves. And I, I change that to our family. And, and I've said this before, is I think we treat our family much better than we treat ourselves. So when that patient, I consider them part of my family, I'm gonna do the best job that I can for them. Um, this is in the face of we keep promoting patient safety and we keep promoting do no harm, but it's been 20 years now that we've had this in our face that we aren't doing such a good job that approximately 100,000 patients die each year of a medical <laughs> error, and most of that is due to our communication. And we've seen in some of the cases today, it truly was communication and the systems in place for the communication. It's not our uh, lack of us trying to do it, it's some of the systems. Even eight years after that, the Inspector General report came out, and this was just Medicare uh, beneficiaries alone, 180,000 deaths due to medical error. And they looked a little closer on how these, to define these medical errors. They uh, looked through the charts for uh, things that had gone to root cause analysis. They looked for what we call our RL solution or incident reports. They also looked for uh, triggers, global triggers within the chart. So if a patient had gotten Narcan, they went back to see if the patient had had an overdose of maybe narcotics and that was an error. Or if they had a positive blood culture, was it related to a central line infection and that was considered an error. So it really depends on what they're looking at and what numbers you can come up with about uh, medical errors. Um, it's also in the lay press, you know, I'm going to show this repetitively over the next over 20 years that uh, in uh, the WHO, going into a hospital is far riskier than uh, flying, that you have a 1 in 10, 10 chance of something happening to you when you're in a hospital. Um, John James was a, uh, the lead toxicologist at NASA, now he's the um, president or CEO of patient safety. His son died of a medical error, and so he has a passion for this. And he actually uh, inflated the numbers even higher because what he looked at was everything that the Inspector General report had looked at, but he also looked at some communication issues and how uh, um, physicians weren't communicating with uh, each other in taking care of his son. Uh, one was doing this test but not communicating it to the other test. And, and they also were not following evidence-based guidelines in his care. So he calculated how many uh, uh, medical errors would be uh, added to that IOG report if we didn't follow evidence-based guidelines, if we didn't communicate and we didn't do standard cares, and really pushed that up even four times higher uh, than the prior reports. Um, if medical error was actually on a death certificate, it would be the third leading cause, way above trauma, way above uh, motor vehicle crashes, and way above fi firearms. But we don't put that on, a on the medical examiner report, so it's hard to know what those numbers really are. They're all over the place. They're probably, the reports are probably a magnitude higher, and we're getting more and more reports like this one from Australia where they, they have a good registry system where they can actually delve into it more and we're looking at maybe 10% events with only a 1.2% mortality with them. So they are coming down in the reports uh, over the years. Um, so what happens to this? You know, man, we, we pledge to do the best we can and all we do is see these reports in the lay press seeing how, saying how bad we are. And that can actually lead to burnout and emotionally overextended, becoming callous, and uh, having low personal accomplishments. And uh, as I said in my Western Trauma resident, um, report, I was there. Um, I was there a number of years ago in 
you know, we were building a trauma center similar to what you were building a trauma center or have a trauma center here. We had three of us. We were we went from 1,500 admissions to 5,000 in our registry in a short period of time. We had developed a system in Oklahoma where we were the only level one trauma center. We were taking all the traumas, uh, the higher level or the highest priority traumas, and we had a backup system where some of the community hospitals should have taken the lower level traumas, but they were coming in also. And so we were filling up our, our, our hospital is not as large as you. It's uh, less than 400 beds. We were putting trauma patients in holes and beds and making up beds and trying to take care of ICU patients in uh, uh, three or four different ICUs and it was always that last patient that you saw that was the sickest and you know they were close to death and the family wasn't happy with you and uh, so we were coming up on a trauma center site visit and I don't think we had Dr. Jerkovich, thank gosh he's rough and you know <laughs> but uh, we were coming up on a site visit and I was I was you know sphincter tightened, you know, as we talked. Uh, I was like, we cannot have a mistake. We can't, you know, and if we do have a mistake, we've got to investigate it to the nth degree. And, uh, you know, I was riding my faculty. Uh, I thought I was educating them, but I was, was really kind of on them uh, constantly and pointing out uh, errors and pointing out this and that and not helping them at all. And what was the best thing about it is they realized that that wasn't me. Uh, as my friends here know that I'm not that individual uh, type of thing and not I, I have I, I do want the ut ultimate for my patients but not to the expense of uh, the residents and the faculty and all th those things so you know, my my chair actually discovered that and and said you know you need to take some time off and you need to get some leadership help and and I went to do that and I, and I did get help and that was probably one of the best things that I, I've ever done and as we know, we're surgeons, we are resilient. We can hold up this uh, tree in the Bahamas when it was falling down and we go there to help them now. But we, we do have the ability to recover from, from setbacks. And what I realized was uh, acceptance of reality. So on top of all that stuff at work, I had also lost four of my family members to death. My, my sister who was the closest to me, which was three years older than me, and she was that person I could bounce things off of when things got rough and uh, didn't have her anymore uh, and didn't have my mom and didn't have my brother or my father. Uh, um, and, and so all of a sudden you're the leader of the big team and you're leader of the family and me who had was the youngest person in my family was not used to leading the family. I could lead teams in sports and I could lead teams in, in work, but throwing that extra family thing on there was uh, difficult. I had to spend more time outside the hospital. The hospital had previously become my family and my patients had become my uh, family as, as theirs were and, and uh, it was hard to separate that. You know, and it was probably not healthy to, to adopt some of the patients in their family as your family. Um, you need to care for them, but you need to get have a space between there. Um, and so uh, it also, I realized that life was meaningful. Like some people who uh, burn out, uh, they don't have such a, a resilient bounce back. You know, get back into it and, and strive for that. There's a high uh, incidence of depression and a high incidence of suicide in people who burn out. But your life is meaningful, as is your patient's life. And, and then I was improvising because I was uh, one of these resilient people. I could improvise. But in part of that time that I took off, I did a number of leadership uh, courses and tr truly learned how to become a, a leader and uh, kind of re refocused into the patient safety area. And so that that's just where this comes in. So how do you, uh, what are some controlled interventions to reduce burnout in a physician and pay, and uh, uh, one of them was structural changes. Uh, the next is communication, and uh, and the next is then teamwork. And this is what patient safety is, and that's what it's good to see what uh, you're all doing here. Um, so if you look at patient safety, and this is one of the American Health uh, Care resources uh, of quality has the team steps approach. And look at it: structure, communication, and then leadership and situational awareness, which is all what is the same as this, structural changes, fostering communication, and cultivating a sense of teamwork and, and job control. And so patient safety really fit into 
getting me uh, out of where I was into a place where I could do uh, excellent patient care again and foster that in our um, in our um, hospital and our in our um, uh, department. And I'm truly not Peter Provenost. Uh, uh, Peter Provenost saved thousands and thousands of lives with his central line infection prevention uh, strategies that he has. Has gone down to many health systems and many. Uh, established a whole uh, center in Michigan where they all follow a, a, his central line placement uh, policies and procedures and he decreased the central line infections and saved people. And that all came out of Josie's story, which was a young child who died at their institution uh, of a preventable bloodstream infection. Uh, Atul Gawande, we'll get into that a little bit later in this talk about checklist manifesto. We've got a picture of uh, Sully Sullenberg's book. I've read three or four of them now uh, in regards to his ability to be a leader and to uh, foster um, safety in the airline industry. I kind of got into this with uh, Dr. Shackford at Western uh, Trauma. He didn't think that we were quite the same as, uh, as the airline industry, but there is some commonality between us and the airline industry. It's good to see that you all have taken patient safety seriously and have it part of your educational process that we can see here, because that's what the CLARE or the ACGME require. And uh, I was uh, talked last night, we were up in um, Kansas a, a few uh, weeks ago and actually looked at their quality and patient safety program, and they have a whole month rotation in patient safety that their medicine residents do. Uh, following around the pa patient safety medical officer such as myself and going to RCAs and going to uh, uh, disclosures and a number of uh, events and he actually puts on lectures through that month. The, the disheartening thing was that they did it with the medicine residents and that was difficult to get surgery involved in that and they'd have been trying and trying to uh, to involve them and I know we have important things to do in saving lives and learning uh, operations, but I think safety is also important. And we'll talk about what the American College of Surgeons is recommending now. So uh, I think you all know this, that the Clare Pathways of Excellence in Patient Safety, you know, reporting and teaching how to report near, event, near misses will go into that, education on safety, and then developing a culture of safety at your institution. So back to structure. Uh, the structure is, you know, just to, so you know why we need that, is the majority of patient safety events are human factors, leadership, and communication. And the same occurs with the things that we have to report uh, in regards to uh, surgical or invasive procedures, those not never events, but those reportable events such as wrong site surgery, wrong patient, uh, wrong procedure, uh, unintended retention of foreign objects, uh, and then intraoperative deaths. So these are things that we need to learn to, to report and to, um, to investigate. So structural changes as far as patient safety are, is really in changing that culture where everybody uh, reports. Everybody's looking for something to improve the patient care. They accept the responsibility for patients. We prioritize uh, safety. We encourage and reward. Uh, one institution that I read about actually um, penalizes people. If they find that there was a safety event that wasn't reported, that unit or that department will get penalized in some way and have consequences for not reporting it. Um, we want to have an organization that learns from our accidents, as you point out in your in your RCAs or your uh, the diagrams that you have after your um, complications. And we need an institution that provides the appropriate resources, structure, and accountability. So first it starts with the culture. You know, I grew up in a pathologic culture. M&M's was not like this. I would have cold, I wouldn't sleep the night before going to M&M's. I would be up and just worried about what anything that darts were going to get thrown at me. And, and get blamed for some of the complications and not understand that this is human. I am human. I am going, I know all the steps in doing a peg tube and I put one in where I didn't have, trans, or didn't have the correct, uh, all the steps in it. So uh, we want to get away from that. Uh, I've been in a bureau bureaucratic uh, um, type of uh, um, culture and I myself probably made one of those bureaucratic cultures in 
the time when I was having my little uh, meltdown or my little burnout area. <laughs> the residents at the time made bracelets and, and uh, out of construction paper that said WWRD on them. What would Roxy do? Okay, because it was my ICU, we did things my way, and, uh, you know, I had reasons. I taught them how to do that, but, <laughs> you know, you have to let them in. It's just not one person. And you have to let them be able to come to you with problems and solutions. So it's great to see that most places have now come to this generative culture, which uh, really is, it's uneasy because you, you need to report, but they seek and learn and, and want to change and make it an integral part of what we do is everybody's looking for things, talking about things, learning from it, not hiding it. You know, we used to hide complications uh, so they didn't get presented here. Don't, don't put that on the paper. You know, don't put that down. I'm going to hide that. But we don't want to hide it because we want to learn from it so the next generation, the next people uh, can, um, don't have to repeat the same problem. So we want to come to a, a trust or a just culture, a culture in which individuals come forward with the mistakes without fear of punishment. And that's the thing. You want people to come. You want them to come report. But there are times where you have to have be tough love or you've got to be tough. So majority of people who, who have heirs, 95% um, of them, it, it's that they, you know, had a slip or a lapse or something like that. And you just sit down and talk to them and say, hey, you know, you had this error, you had this complication, uh, you know, or you had this incident where you acted out. That's not you. I know it. We sit down with a cup of coffee. You talk about it. You talk about the perceptions of the people around them and they change. But then there's other people that have repetitive issues, repetitive complications, repetitive incidents, uh, and, and, and repetitive acts. And those have to be set up a structure where they get monitored. And if they don't meet that, then you come up with uh, more harsh uh, consequences. And then there's people who really push boundaries. They overstep. They really violate policies and procedures and things such as uh, racist comments or uh, issues that can't be tolerated. Sometimes they just need to be separated early. So there's that just culture where you not, you know, not everything's a pass. There are certain things that, that need to be dealt with and they need to be dealt with a little more firmly and harshly at times. Um, and that leads to where we go in quality and safety to what's called a high reliability organization, which the American College is really pushing in their quality programs at this point in time. So what is a high reliable uh, uh, corporation? It's similar to what I've just talked about earlier in the slide it, as far in this presentation about structure. It's that collective mindfulness of the entire institution from the uh, human resources to the cleaning people to uh, the CEO of the hospital walking around looking for issues that might uh, make it a better institution. Uh, preoccupied with failure. We don't want to fail. We want to look for things that will help us uh, maintain our high stature. Sensitive to operations or situational awareness. We're always looking around at each other. You know, are you okay? We're checking in with each other to see, hey, so-and-so just doesn't seem right lately. You know, what's going on? And asking each other if there's something outside the hospital that might be influencing that that we can help them with or within the hospital that we can help them with. Um, so we're reporting no harm. We want to find the harm events before they meet somebody. As you know, we want to get those near misses. We don't want it to reach the individual uh, uh, to uh, uh, injure them. So we want to stop it. So examples are as a family member can help us. You know, they can see that you know, I've never seen them get that color pill before. What is that pill? And it may be the wrong pill. We want to uh, find them before they reach the individual because uh, it's an active uh, process. That's why pharmacy looks at our orders before they get to a patient. Um, the events that reach the individual but can cause harm, yeah, there are things that are going to reach them, but hopefully they won't cause severe harm. They may fall. They may not be injured. They may need to be monitored more. So we want to get to those, those near misses. And why? Because it makes a, a, enables a proactive resolution to the hazards. 
it engages the workforce in that they, hey, I found that before, you know, something happened. Uh, before the patient, uh, and, and this down in the lower, oops, there we go, aha, this. So anybody notice, I know you don't look at the back of anesthesia machines often, but anything wrong with that picture? So it should be green, blue, and yellow. And actually gray is usually the CO2 that goes in the back of the laparoscopic carts. This is a lighter CO2. So this should be air, it should be yellow. It, it was air when they tested it, but it was in the wrong color tank, which was good. Or somebody may, and thank God they have analyzers of the gases that go through the anesthesia machine, or that could have been a, a real problem too. So we actually want to find things before they happen. It helps the workforce uh, uh, identify uh, issues like that. It exposes some valuable information that we can discuss, and we develop a positive attitude when we work together to find these no harm events. High reliability organizations also have a reluctance to simplify. What we do is really, really complicated. All the steps that we do to make, to care for a patient has, as we've seen in, in your presentations this morning, uh, if you miss one of those steps, something can happen to that patient. They can develop AKI from, uh, and uh, from not being able to have the labs reported to them. So we don't want to simplify. We don't want to cut corners. We need to continue to uh, mod to do what we do in the, in the uh, uh, stepwise fashion. We need to commit to resilience. So if something happens, it shouldn't paralyze us. We should be able to go on and, and try to fix that and say that's not going to happen again but not perseverate on it, to go on and, and uh, continue our high uh, excellence of care. And then the deference to, uh, to excellence, and that comes straight out of the crew resource management, is that anybody in that cockpit and anybody in that airplane can speak up. The stewardess in the back who smells something that's unusual, because they're in that back of the plane all the time, every day they're flying, and when they hear or smell or see something unusual, they should be able to call the pilot and say, hey, we need to, to not take off because something is something unusual is going on here. And the same thing should happen in, in our environment uh, in the hospital, that we should be able to stop the line. Um, if we go back to leadership. The leadership really needs to commit to that goal of uh, zero patient harm. And that's where the American College comes in, is we really, can we get there? We should be able to get there. They're getting there in other industries. They're getting there in the nuclear power uh, area. They're getting there in some of the uh, some of the uh, car industries. We're still having some, uh, you know, cars take off by themselves or not stop when they should stop. But it's much less than the numbers we're seeing in uh, in healthcare. So we need to incorporate some of the principles that they have done in industry, in the car industry, in the nuclear industry, in the uh, in the um, uh, airline industry. Uh, one of those, and I'm not going to go into it a lot, is adopting the Lean or Six Sigma uh, type of processes where we're really analyzing the plan, do, act, uh, continually walking through uh, places, doing the gimbal walk, all these uh, uh, <laughs> different um, uh, Asian terms. Uh, but we, what we've done at University of Oklahoma is, is kind of do proactive patient safety now. Uh, we really look at failure modes analysis uh, or effects analysis. So we ask when we're going to put out a new policy or a new procedure, we ask, you know, really what could go wrong, uh, why would it fail, uh, failure happen, and what would the consequences be? And I'll kind of blow one of these up a little bit. Um, uh, so this one is uh, medications ordered that, that may be available uh, in early, I'm sorry, Medications ordered may be available and easily accessed in a dispensing machine before a pharmacist can even look at it. So in our operating room, in the emergency department, we can get medications out of, uh, out of some of our Pixis machines without a pharmacy overview. Well, what happens that the patient may receive the incorrect medication, uh, incorrect dose, or a dose uh, um, uh, via the incorrect route? And we've seen that with heparin. The first thing that pops up in our EMR for uh, subcutaneous he or for heparin prophylaxis, it's an ID heparin. We have had incidences where 
you know, that's what's picked because that's what comes up first in the EMR when you're ordering uh, heparin for DVT prophylaxis or VTE prophylaxis, and we've kit and they've gotten IV heparin uh, instead of subcutaneous heparin. So what's the likelihood of that occurring? Well, uh, and then you look at the likelihood of the detection, the likelihood of the comparison, and it gets a risk profile number. So the higher the risk profile number, the higher the chances of that uh, causing an adverse event on a patient, and we attack those uh, areas first. So that is really it's the uh, detection times the severity times the occurrence rate to, to get that. And we designed programs to try to prevent these things. So we put a pharmacist in the emergency department. We put a, you know, things that are um, um, such a, things such as neuromuscular blockers are not readily available to uh, uh, people because as you've seen in the, lit in the literature uh, uh, in Vanderbilt recently, somebody was going for Versed. They put in VE and it came up vecuronium. So the patient got a neuromuscular blocker instead of Versed. They said the same thing with Norcuron and uh, Narcan. You put that in, it's like words. So instead of Narcan, they get another thing uh, to not reverse them to even make the situation different. So you put people in the areas to help try to prevent that as one way to stop it. We've also developed CUSP teams, comprehensive unit-based uh, safety program teams. And the one we did on the trauma floor was we had a hemorrhagic code. So it, we had a code. It wasn't a cardiac code. This patient was hemorrhaging because we're pushing the envelope. We're putting people who have solid organ injuries up on the floor or higher grade solid organ injuries, grade four and five spleens, and then we put them on uh, Lovenox because we have to not have a DVT, and of course they bleed. But they become hypotensive. They can arrest, and it's not just pushing on the heart and giving them drugs that's going to get them back. It's giving them, getting blood up there and getting IV access in them. Uh, and so, and the other problem we have is pneumothoraces, developing into tension pneumothoraces. So we may have a, a breathing problem that develops uh, the code event and not a cardiac problem. And we didn't have the things up on the floor to be able to uh, manage those because it's very infrequent. And so we didn't have chest tube sets. We didn't have high, high, large bore IVs. We didn't have IO catheters. We didn't, have, didn't teach the nurses how to quickly uh, get emergency release blood to those patients. So we put together a cart that has uh, all the equipment on it. And we actually rotate that cart because, because, it, because it's an infrequent event, things were expiring. And so couldn't have the things up there because then we would expire and it costs the institution money. So if we had a cart that we rotated down to the ICUs uh, uh, frequently and they get use the equipment off of it, then we start up on the floor, move it down the ICU, get a new one, start up on the floor, move it down to the ICU. Things weren't expiring. So we have the things up on the floor to respond to these hemorrhagic emergencies or, or uh, breathing emergencies. And, and how we did that is we put together a team of residents, nurses, uh, and leaders. And it took a while for us to convince the hospital and our uh, central supply that we should buy these carts, spend the money on it, and, and get those up there. But when you have a leader that's part of your uh, CUSP team, it really helps because they, un they understand the problem and they understand patient safety. The other thing we've done is more checklists. And one of the checklists we worked hard on was one in the operating room. Uh, and first we had to convince everybody that yes, checklists are important, okay? Yes, they do decrease mortality and showed this study from South Carolina where hospitals that adopted a voluntary checklist uh, in the perioperative uh, uh, area could actually decrease the mortality. So. Um, we had retained foreign bodies. We had specimens that were lost. We had dirty instruments that were coming up to the IC or to the OR uh, that we would discover uh, hopefully before it got to the patient in a couple areas. So, you know, we we really worked in a multidisciplinary fashion to come up with these check checklists to to have a briefing before the patient went back. Let's make sure we have seen an EKG. A new EKG. I know they went through pre-op, but somebody ordered another EKG, and we better have looked at that before they go back, 
or they could maybe have a cardiac event because things can happen in a month or so. We need to make sure in our big cases that we have the type and cross done before we start bleeding and we don't have the type and cross and we don't have the emergent or blood up in the room. That we have stopped anticoagulation in those patients who are on anticoagulation who need it stopped, but we give anticoagulation to those that we can give beforehand. So it's a num it's a discussion, it's a communication with the nurse, the surgeon, and the anesthesiologist before the patient goes back while the patient's awake and can be part of that discussion. Our timeout, we keep expanding it as we find some issues with uh, our um, uh, within our OR. As I said, we had some dirty instruments that almost got to the patient. What happened in that case? Well, the nurse was out of the room. The tech decided to just open up everything by themselves and not have the second check person there. The nurse came back, and thank goodness, before it was even after they prepped, but before they even touched anything, she looked in the canister and saw that the indicator hadn't changed and stopped the line. So that doesn't happen anymore. That's part of our checklist. Is before we prep, the nurse has looked to make sure that all those indicators have shown that we have sterile instruments uh, in the room. And then the debriefing. As I said, we've had, had some issues with lost specimens. Part of our debriefing is before the, the attending surgeon leaves the room, okay, what's the specimen and where is it, where is it going to go to? Uh, and correct sponge counts is, you know, Retain foreign objects uh, is a big deal, and I'll talk to about one of our incidences here. We've also done team steps. So to roll out our checklist, we put our all our teams through team steps. We put the, and it was mainly nurses and general surgery. We didn't get a number of the subspecialists in it, but we went through the team steps training where we learned how to, to communicate and how to monitor each other and do situational awareness. And we based it again off of research where uh, the group in, in, Carol in uh, Roanoke, uh, Virginia has done this. They took their trauma team through it. They did the briefing aspect. They did the uh, step aspect where you constantly go back to monitor the patient. They looked at stopping the line. I'm concerned. I'm uncomfortable. This is a safety issue where they taught the individuals in their trauma team or their trauma resuscitation room to say that. They had call outs where, and that's my biggest frustration, and I know you all have this relationship to the with the military, and I think it probably helps you in that when you say something, you want somebody to say, got it, or heard it, you know? <laughs> Need a unit of O negative. Going to get the O negative, and they go to the, to the uh, cooler and get it. Uh, that just doesn't happen, and, and you keep calling it out, and, and you really want that closed-loop communication taught in these teams, and that's what Team Steps did for them, and they actually showed that it, it decreased some of the times to CAT scan, to their FAST exam, and to the operating room uh, in those critical patients. And then they showed that, well, we didn't continue this. We didn't continue to have Team Steps. We didn't continue to teach that communication and those skills, and everything went back down. So it's important once you find a, a program to continue with that program or find one that's supplemental to that that's similar to it. And I want to finish the talk by talking about some, uh, some errors. You know, as we saw today, we are not error-free. We are going to have errors, and we have to accept that it's inevitable no matter how hard we try. And that's how I got into my little burnout e episode It's like, I cannot have an error, and nobody can have an error, and we're not going to have it, but, you know, hey, I've had errors, and I'm going to talk about a couple of them, and I've dealt with it, and, and I've changed my focus is not just trauma director now, I'm patient safety medical director, and it's given me some new life to help teach this aspect of our, um, uh, uh, of our careers, and so we're going to have a slip. We're going to forget to plug in the SCD machine in the operating room. We may not look at it. That's part of our checklist that's, that it's plugged in because we have forgot it. We're going to have lapses. Sometimes we're going to put in a central line and we're going to get called off to do something else and we're not going to get the order in to do the, che to do the chest x-ray. That should all be some sort of an order set. You know, I'm going to put in a central line and as soon as you say that, there's an order set that has all the components of what you're going to need for the procedure and after the procedure so you don't have that lapse. That should, um, 
They do it in, under, in, in other industries. Uh, we're going to have hopefully not violations because violations, when you kind of purposefully don't follow a protocol, as I said earlier, we need to have consequences. So we need to have less violations, people not, follow, not knowing and not following the protocols out there. So root cause analysis, you guys know there's never just one <coughs> cause of it, so you can't get to that root. And we've actually gone to the RCA squares, which instead of having an RCA with all the individuals involved in that event in the same room, we do it kind of mini RCAs. So I take the surgical group, the OR director takes the uh, operative team, uh, and anesthesia meets with their residents and the CRNAs. And then we as leaders run the, those mini RCAs, and then we come together so that nobody feels um, inhibited in their speaking to their leaders and to each other. Because uh, if a tech is in a room with me, I've been there for 19 years now and kind of have a reputation of being uh, kind of, you know, everything's got to be just right, they, they may not speak up with me in the room, but they'll speak up with their uh, mutual uh, individuals in the room. So we have many RCAs and we all come together and we meet and talk about how we can solve it. We really want to get to those corrective actions to, uh, to change processes. Um, my event, I'll talk about a couple of them. My near miss was uh, uh, a near retained foreign body. Uh, and we talk about what happened, what normally happens, the policies and procedures and do the five whys. I was on a Sunday, I was gonna take a patient back who had been, uh, had an open pelvis fracture, uh, had packs in the thigh wound also, and I was supposed to go back and just take out the thigh combat gauze and close up the open pelvis fracture that was just above the inguinal ligament and then irrigate out the thigh and probably put a vac on that. And, you know, that's what I was told. I'm like, okay. You know, I look through the uh, prior uh, operative reports, the brief operative reports. Some of them were missing. Uh, but went to the operating room. Uh, got in the operating room, took the combat off, gauze out of the thigh, washed that out, stopped all the bleeding, debrided a little bit of tissue, and then went into the groin area, followed up uh, the, above the ingual ligament down towards the iliac vessels, and, huh, laparotomy pad. Well, why is there a laparotomy pad in here? Nobody told me there was a laparotomy pad. If I hadn't done my due diligence in really reaching down by the iliac vessels, I wouldn't have known it was there. Asked the nurses, I go, what is, what's in the EMR? Is there, or is there a retained foreign body in the EMR? They're like, no, it says counts were correct. Yeah, <laughs> they're always correct. You wouldn't close if they're not correct, but it said counts were correct. Uh, and I go, boy, I looked at all those operative notes and I just, you know, finally I called up one of the surgeons, an ortho guy who had been involved. He goes, no, I didn't leave anything in there. And then uh, called the vascular guy. I go, oh yeah, I, I put it in my note. And if you looked at his note, it was like, you had to read his whole operative note, and all it said was lap pad, pad placed, and then on with the rest of part of the procedure. It didn't say anything like that, and I was like, well, I thought that was just he packed it in there and pulled it back out. So why, the five whys, so why did this happen? Well, it was an emergency procedure. Counts weren't done, okay? Uh, they got into bleeding, so the vascular surgeon got called in, and uh, so they had three teams operating. Uh, why didn't the nurses document it in the EMR? They didn't know. There wasn't communication between the techs and the nurses, and they had so many <clears throat> nurses in there and so much turnover during the case that nobody took the responsibility. And the last person then that had to fill out the paperwork was like, yep, must have been correct, because I didn't hear anything from anybody that, that it wasn't correct. So it's always going through those whys. Why did this happen? And thank goodness we didn't, you know, that was a near miss that we reported and investigated. And what did we do from that? Well, if I wasn't at the first operation, we need to get x-rays before we close. So if we have multiple teams, we need to get x-rays at some point in time. You may not need to do it in the OR, but you need to do it between before you close. Uh, and if that is in the OR, you need to do it. So we expanded when we get x-rays uh, in surgical procedures. So again, it was a perfect storm uh, that always happens in these situations. 
The other one was a lost specimen, and this was part of my Western trauma address. This was on a friend of mine. She asked me to, to uh, do her splenectomy for ITP. And I was like, you really need to have a laparoscopic splenectomy. Nowadays, it is not, you know. And she's like, she's like no, I'm going to bleed. I'm going to die. You know, I can't have a laparoscopic splenectomy. And I'm like, yes, you know, yes, you can. We have a great minimally invasive surgeon. Um, she goes, well, I want you to be there uh, when she does it. So I said, okay, I'll be there in case we have to open. So now we have two surgeons in the room. We have a brand new minimally invasive person. We have a senior surgeon there. So we have two surgeons. We had two nurses because she was uh, somebody in, that worked in the hospital. And uh, so we had two nurses in there because they wanted the best nurses in there. We had two scrub techs. We had a, a new scrub tech who was learning to become part of our team with one of our other scrub techs. We had two of everybody in the room. <laughs> and we had the rep in there because he came in early to talk about her next case, which was her first uh, vertical or her first uh, sleeve gastrectomy or something like that. So as you could tell, we had a number of problems when we looked at this and how we lost this specimen. It's a laparoscopic procedure, so that was the method. Uh, laparoscopic procedure, the specimen is morselated. It looked like it was a hematoma. I pulled it out. I don't know if I said spleen. I do that every time I take something out of a body. I go kidney, spleen, hunk of liver, small bowel, you know, I, I name it. I don't know. We might have been talking. I could, you know, even that day I could, sat there and said, what did I do? What, could I have done that? Uh, the EMR, our, the method or machines, our EMR allowed us to leave the operating room without the nurses completing the case. And because they wanted to get the next case going and they were rushed, they didn't finish their documentation until they were well into that second case. And when they got to specimen, they were like, oh, where's the specimen? And they actually, they actually stopped everything at that point. Those two nurses traded out and they went down to the dock where the garbage is and started digging through garbage for the next four hours to try to find that specimen uh, for that individual. Um, you know, the environment, too many conversations were going on. Uh, people were distracted and we didn't, do, we didn't follow our debriefing. I was on trauma because I was just helping on the case. So I was trying to do two things at one time and I got called to a trauma. So I left, I didn't debrief. This brand new minimally invasive surgeon didn't know our processes yet. We hadn't done the right education for her and she left and they didn't make her debrief before she left. And that happens every time now. I, I'm constantly running <laughs> and before I leave the room, somebody stops the line and says, Dr. Robert. I'm like, oh, debrief, yeah, okay. <laughs> Wound classification, specimen, uh, where's the pa you know, how'd the patient do, where are they going afterwards, who's going to take care of them afterwards, because a number of our patients are operated by orthopedics, but they're going to go to the trauma ICU, so we want to make sure that that communication is there. So there's like several things in our debriefing that are very, very important in the patient care. So in these, as you've seen in your um, uh, events that you presented today, that the Swiss cheese holes just line up, that there's problems with roles and communication, too many distractions, there's anxiety, and there's a lack of education that sometimes leads to these risk events. And that's what we need to work on. You know, I think the military does it the best. They have uh, clinical care guidelines that the whole teams are talked to and taught before they go out into those austere environments. They constantly monitor things through the registries that they have in the military to make sure their CPGs are uh, online. They learn from any defects that happen in those CPGs and then they educate the new teams. So structured communication teamwork and that's where you get there. And when you do that, you get wins. Like this hospital is uh, got many awards, you know, national rankings for 10 adult specialties and five children's specialties. Uh, Dr. Farmer, congratulations. Um, the high performing in a number of areas and then uh, regional recognition about uh, where you're ranking. So these are things that are important to your patients as well as your hospital to do well. At OU, we've had some wins because of some of the 
proactive things that we've done. We had a joint commission report that we've got great grades on. Everything was in that safe area of their safer mat uh, matrix. Um, and especially they commented on our FMEIA process where we, before we roll out things, we'd look at where they're going to impact uh, things. We recently were named number one in the state or number one in the, in the region uh, for this uh, and um, kind of got high rankings in our cancer center. Um, and what's, what's better is I always have to show this photo is I allowed my husband to have surgery at our place. I trusted the system, okay? <laughs> he actually did quite well and he behaved. So, <laughs> you know, it's good. <laughs> and so I want to finish by, by thanking you again for allowing me to, to give this name lecture. And, uh, uh, um, you know, I, I am still upset about the loss of one of your true leaders and, and, and true people who guided this institution. Uh, but again, thanks. Uh, thank you all.